So, you know, it's funny, these two examples really annoy me, actually. Because <laughs> I can these, tell. Are two, these are the two consistent examples I keep getting from Muslims. They changed the language from Ottoman Turkish to Turkish. That affected the ulama. They removed Arabic. That affected the ulama. They closed the madrasas. That affected the ulama. They closed the Nizamiya courts. That affected the ulama. They banned them from wearing headdress. That affected the ulama. They, closed, they took them out of parliament. That affected Every single place where Islam's gaze was upon, they gutted it out. Ottoman history and its story has been until recent times the sole endeavour of Western Orientalists and academics. This has changed as many more Turkish and Muslim historians have recaptured the narrative through meticulous archival work and the retrieval of sources that have recalibrated how we view the last Islamic caliphate. In this second part of an extended interview with one such Ottoman historian, Dr. Yakub Ahmed from Istanbul University, we take a look at some of the challenges and controversies that are associated with the ulama during the latter period of the Ottoman Empire. I asked Dr. Ahmed to explain why it is claimed that the ulama were an obstruction to the progress of the caliphate. We scrutinize the claims that the ulama outlawed the printing press and coffee. I also ask him about the ulama's role in the deposition of Abdul Hamid II, a revivalist of the caliphate. This week, we continue the discussion by looking broadly at the latter period of the Ottomans, right up to the changes brought about by post-Ottoman secular Turkey and how that impacted the ulama class. Let's go to the 18th, 19th century and, and uh, the, the uh, period of colonization and, and you know, pe period of interaction with Western ideas and, and revolutionary ideas that come from France and, and elsewhere. And um, uh, again, we, we spoke about this at length when we uh, had our discussion about uh, Ottoman decline, but uh, it is often said that the... Uh, ulama became a hindrance at this point or an impediment for the progress of society and and a number of examples are, are, are cited you know the ulama banned the printing press and disallowed uh, the publication of material using uh, these this new form of modern uh, printing technology when coffee was uh, was uh, was imported uh, or was used and consumed by Ottoman citizens that uh, the ulama responded by by banning it and likening it to alcohol which is patently isn't and I suppose the, these uh, these examples these two examples in particular are used to to paint a picture of a backwards looking a a stymied ulama who who are uh, who, who've just become institutionalized and and, and care only for uh, the maintenance of their, um, uh, their their patronage and their prestige, rather than uh, the progression of of the Ottoman state. I mean, to what extent is this a? Uh, you know, let's go through the two examples, and and you know, to what extent was this the case that the ulama had now become a problem for the Ottoman state? So you know, it's funny. These two examples really annoy me, actually, because these are the, <laughs> two, consi these are the two consistent examples I keep getting from Muslims. Yes. And what's interesting is I always ask, uh, just as a you know, just to to understand the, the thought process behind the question, why is someone backwards because they they don't drink coffee? What's coffee got to do? Well, with I'm it? a tea drinker, so I, I you know I I completely agree with you. But... It, it, it's intriguing how we've internalized the idea that the banning of coffee in of itself is somehow a hindrance of, to progression, right? So the actual underlining factor here, both coffee and the printing press, is the notion of progress. It's the idea of progress. What does it mean to, to progress and to be progressive? The Ottoman ulama, by and large, I mean, yes, you say right now that coffee isn't like alcohol, but you've got to understand how, let's look at alcohol first and then we'll look at coffee. And let's look at intoxicants by and large. Um, so throughout Islamic history, you know, there were times where people were drinking things and they didn't realize they were in talk. It was a it was alcohol even because people are making alcohols from various things. So they'll go to a particular society and go, what is that? That's made from rice. OK, fine. Drinking. They go, well, those people are losing their heads a little bit. Well, maybe that's alcohol. No, it's not alcohol. Alcohol is only made from dates. No, this is actually alcohol. How, how is it alcohol? Let's have a look. 
It's doing this, this, oh, yes, that's actually alcohol. So what the point I'm making is when it comes to food substances, we're taking for granted today because we know, because we, we've come a long, a long way. But when these food substances are initially being introduced within Muslim societies, there's a lot of backwards and forwards to and fro with, uh, um, within society and within ulama trying to diagnose this reality of what is this substance and what is it doing? Coffee... They, the argument was, was that coffee would not intoxicate you, keep you sober, but at the same time, like, do things to your brain. So it's not that coffee was particularly seen as being alcohol, per se. It was being seen within the framework of could it be similar to some, some form of intoxicant. That's a, an argument. And you know what? This is no different than in Britain. If you see the sources in Britain, the, the British clergy and the British state were trying to find ways of banning coffee. Making the argument that this substance that people are drinking, it's 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 keeping them awake all night, and this is worse than alcohol. And what's going on? So this is not a new phenomenon. Um, tobacco, for example, um, in, people keep asking the question: of Why did the ul ulama allow tobacco? Because they saw it as food substance. It came under the, the rules of you chew it; it's food substance. You smoke it. It's only now, in the modern period, we start saying it's haram, or some ulama are making the case it's haram because it's poisonous and so forth, right? So you can see with food substances, there's always a backwards and forwards in regard to drawing opinion. Sometimes, in fairness, the reason why coffee was being banned was actually because people were gathering in coffee houses and trying to plot against the sultan. And so there was a way of trying to find a way of trying to find a legal edict that can say, you know, the stopping of this. Uh, but there were many reasons why coffee in of itself, there was a continual backwards and forwards. So it's not that bizarre for me that an alim would have given a fatwa saying, actually, I'm not sure about this coffee stuff. And then later on, another alim saying, actually, I, no, coffee's fine. And then another alim going, no, actually, I'm not sure. Because it also comes down to the prerogative of what that individual thinks, what the substance is. And it's the same with the ulama today. There are many ulama who make the argument that cigarettes is haram, and others who make the argument that cigarettes are fine. It's mubah, or it's makro, or whatnot, right? It's ikhtilaf. So here, that's the issue of coffee, per se. Was there ever a fatwa from the Sheikh al-Islam to outlaw coffee? Yeah, there would have been. I think so. Hmm. Uh, I, I can't remember which sultan, but there was a, a Sheikh al-Islam. But this is once again important. The Sheikh al-Islam's opinion can it, it's not binding just because he's Sheikh al-Islam. Uh -huh. His office, he, his, his jurisdiction is that he's um, regulating or speaking on to the state and on behalf of the state. But there could have been a host of ulama who were equally prominent in Ottoman society in regards to knowledge, who could write a fatwa counter in that. Or they could be the ijma of a particular set of ulama who would, you know, you can get five, six, seven, eight fatwas countering that. So it was just his, his, his opinion in his capacity as Sheikh al-Islam as the highest dignitary in the state. But nonetheless, as I told you before, it could still be challenged. And there are various things that ulama across the Ottoman domains challenged him. I mean, so the Sheikh Islam did give a particular opinion, but it was countered and coffee was one of them. Where there wasn't a countering was once again, issues probably specifically in relation to the, the Ottoman Sultanate itself. Um, that's when it was, um, um, you know, a little bit more independent. In regards to the printing press, you know, this is really one that I, I need to maybe one day address and sit down and write something about this for Muslims in particular. Um, so Bernard Lewis popularized in the 1960s the idea when he envisaged his, his, his narrative of progress that Muslims were behind because they were restricting the printed press. And what, actually what you see is that um, when the printed press came into the Ottoman world and when uh, Jews were coming from Spain, for example, into the Ottoman domains, that nobody had stopped them from printing. So the question is, is, is when it, it's taken from a, a French orientalist at the time who says the Ottomans banned the printed press and there's a fatwa to say it. I need to see that fatwa. I'm still looking for it. What possibly is, is that the Ottomans banned, what I'm assuming is they banned the printing of specific things in the printed press, which would make, it makes more sense to me. Um, so they would have banned, for example, the printing of the Quran, or they would say, you can use the printed press, but no religious books in, in, in Islam. And then it's been taken to assume that the printed press had been banned in the earlier period, because what you see is that non-Muslim societies were printing. So it's not a ban against the printed press, 
So what is it a ban against? It's not, what we afterwards see is that one of the, the things which is interesting, and I keep saying this to people, is that the Muslim world um, and Islamic civilization is the only civilization in that sense where you can argue where oral tradition and written tradition were being developed equally side by side. And the oral tradition in Islam is important. And a lot of Muslims today are relegating the importance of oral tradition in our tradition in that sense, right? And so when certain things wanted to be printed, the question would have been asked, why do you want to print this? What is the point of printing this? Because printing one is expensive, getting the machinery for this. And two, because particular forms of writing culture, like writing the Quran, were in the hands of the Hattat. It's a particular culture that they were doing. Do we need printed Qur'ans? So in, people don't often ask this question, what were they reading in Europe when they were printing? What they were printing was mainly Bibles and religious works, which the ulama were very careful of that this should not happen in the Arabic context because a mistake by an independent printing house of printing Qur'ans would be catastrophic. So they'll say, no, we're not going to allow that. And people, another instance is, in Europe, certain novels were being printed. In the Ottoman context, when they were buying novels, they liked novels being written by hand that were beautiful and painted and so forth. So they didn't really care for the printed, they, they actually looked at the printed novels in Europe and thought, these look kind of ugly, we don't want these, right? So there's another reason of why people were a bit hesitant regarding the printed press in terms of why do we need a printed press? But another reason is the Latin script and the Arabic script are totally different making a machine that can print in the Arabic script in the same way that the Latin script was operating, it would have been a lot harder and it would have been very um, time consuming. Imagine you have a ba in the beginning, ba in the middle, ba in the end, that's a lot more letters. So in that sense, there's logistical issues. So there was many reasons and issues why the, when the Ottomans, and not just the Ottomans, but Muslims by and large, we're talking about India to the, the the Arab world and so forth, they're looking at the printing press and they're asking themselves, is the technology worthwhile? Does it do something differently that will um, change our society in a way that will give us a heads up? And in the earlier period, they didn't see that because in the earlier period, the printing press wasn't giving Europe any advantage. When it starts to give them an advantage is when Mutafarika, he comes up and he says, you know what, actually, this is an interesting um, form of technology and we should start investing in this and thinking about this and we can use it in various ways. In that sense, academics have accused Mutafarika of being, a, because he was a convert to Islam, of suggesting that, you see, he wasn't a real Muslim and that's why he thought about the printed press because real Muslims couldn't think of that. But in actuality, what you see is that the majority of the Muslim printing houses, they were ulama in the early period. They were ulama who were looking at this uh, printing um, technologies and so forth. Um, and once the Ottomans started in, um, introducing the printed press, um, there was no disadvantage. The main advantage of the printed press appears in the 18th and the 19th century, mainly in the 19th century where newspapers and telegrams and, and so forth start to become important. So Muslims, are, I, when I speak to them, when they talk, they assume that in the 15th century Britain, that they were reading these large newspapers walking down the street. They don't understand what was being printed. So the advantage is, in this sense, is, is not great. And the reason why I want to explain this to you is because these are the same students that speak to me, who then in the 19th century will say, why were the Ottomans codifying? The Ottomans should know that this is a form of secularization. Actually, what you see is that this is a contestation between the written form and the oral form. And the Ottomans were hesitant towards the written form because they knew forms of writing that became printed in this way and mass produced would impact various forms of learning, various forms of the legal structure and so forth because written form and oral form is something which has always been carefully balanced in the Muslim world. So Quran memorization, right? This is a huge thing in the Ottoman domain to memorize Quran. Um, there is a huge thing that you'd go to a court and the Qadi from his, his memory knew what to do and so forth. So the printed press turned a lot of, changed a lot of these things. Now, if you go to my university, for example, um, you'll see that the Mus'hafs are all over the place. Well done, we printed the Mus'hafs. 
They're sitting on people's tops of cupboards and so forth. And the memorization of Mus'haf, what's happening here? So they diminish, somehow something's happened in the modern mindset of the assumption that because you are um, literate in the sense that you can read and write, that you are more intelligent. And that's the notion of progress. And when the Turkish Republic was formed, it pushed a huge um, narrative regarding associating the printed press and printing with progress. So the modern nation states all did this, that printing and progress go hand in hand, and we are progressive from the Ottomans in that sense. What it diminishes is the importance of oral tradition and the importance of oral tradition, and the Ottomans were continuously trying to balance written and oral. So they weren't against the printed press, but whenever new technologies came, there was always a hesitancy. And as I said to you about coffee, and you know, I'm going to say this, this doesn't sound really harsh, but our prophet was illiterate. Okay, we need to understand that, you know, but it didn't diminish him in any shape or form. So the assumption is, is that you're only intelligent or progressive because you can read and write is an inco incorrect perspective for me to hold. We have to find ways, I believe, um, of trying to uh, rekindle the oral tradition because to some degree, the absence of the oral tradition in, in favor of the written tradition to some degree has created, I think, disconnects, spiritual disconnects for, for the current Muslim generation. And they need to understand that. And the Ottomans were well aware of this. You, you said earlier that the ulema were, were hesitant to adopt a constitution. Um, you know, it, it can this, your, your previous explanation, can it explain why that hesitancy existed? Because they're, they're balancing these various uh, traditions uh, within the Ottoman space. In terms of constitutionalism, it's actually a mixed bag. There were some ulama who were in favor of constitutionalism and some not so much. So um, by the 19th century, a lot of the ulama are in favor of constitutionalism, which is interesting. So look, let's look at, we have someone like Sayyid Nursi who doesn't have a problem with constitutional discourse. We have someone like Mustafa Sabri Effendi in Istanbul who doesn't have a problem with constitutional discourse. He supports constitutionalism. Sheikh Rashid Reda, Muhammad Abdul are in support of constitutionalism. The point I'm making here is these are different ulama of different persuasions, different intellectual persuasions, um, who still, um, to some degree, are in favor of constitutional discourse. I guess in the 19th century onwards, constitutionalism became the zeitgeist of the time, not only in the Ottoman domains, but in the world, world over. And that's because the, the political um, sort of machineries had changed to a point where um, they required the need to document um, the rules of the administration. And, but it's not only that, they're writing constitutions as a way of creating uh, a sense of sovereignty because of their domains being under continual attack. So the documents are written that, look, this is, this is our sphere of influence. This is what we control. Istanbul is always going to be the capital of the Ottoman domains. We, the Ottomans, are always going to be caliphs because once it's written in documentation, to some degree, it's binding. So what we're starting to see now, the language of all constitutions is vague, by the way, so that there's maneuverability in it. But um, this is a shift from, um, you know, the, the culture, which was that we had always known. This was always known by tradition. And um, so we're seeing a, a, an adjustment taking place. The printed press does help here. The printed press helps in the construction of constitutions in, in terms of documents, in terms of the printed press helps in terms of newspapers now becoming part of the culture of the world, all over the world. People are reading newspapers so you can educate the mass regarding um, the readership levels. Um, books are being created uh, far more quickly um, that are not only, not only belong to the elites, so one of the interesting things is, is we forget how book culture worked and why the printing press was a little different in the West than Europe, shall I say, than the Ottomans, because it had print capitalism behind it. People were buying books, um, whereas in the Muslim world, there was no real interest in buying books. Um, people wouldn't interact with uh, um, knowledge in that way, because in the West, the books are written to be read, whereas in the Muslim world, books were written to be taught. It's a very different style of interacting with books. Now, that's not to say other books were not being produced. And so in the 19th century in schools, regarding, so Montefaraka makes his argument in issues to do with science and maths and so forth, we should start printing books because this will make it easier in the educational system. So um, in, 
what, what we're seeing is when the Ottomans are thinking about printing books, they're thinking about, you know, learning and knowledge and, and so forth. And the newspapers are aligned to this sort of culture. Newspaper culture and educational transformation went hand in hand. It's very interesting. And the majority of the teachers who are probably in the educational system were also journalists who are writing in the printed press in this sense. So um, you, you see um, this sort of development taking place. And this is changing the nature of the state. And because the nature of the state is changing because of this sort of like, um, you can call like uh, modernization that, that's taking place here, then the need for written documentation becomes more and more because the need for expertise becomes more and more significant. And because a lot of things in regards to trade and capital and so forth are taking place because things are being printed and being put down onto paper. And this is the shift that takes place. Um, and it's not just that. Um, you know, these printed technologies then give the possibilities of ideological movements like the Wahhabis to be able to be visible for the first time, like the Salafis to be visible for the first time, like the Mahdist movement to be visible for the first time. Why were they not visible prior to this? Because actually in actuality, the printing press gave them their agency because now they can produce and, and promote ideas and create particular imaginations. Newspaper culture, is then fascinating because that changes something because that introduces a new form of what you could call intellectual learning. There's ulum ad -Din, but now there's newspaper culture. And even the ulama are asking, like, how do we interact as Muslims with newspaper culture? We don't want to be people who tell gossip and so forth. And so they create journals, ulama journals and so forth. But you look at the case of Rashid Ridda, he actually wants to be a proper journalist. He wants to be a journalist like there's a fire in, in Cairo you know, and things like that. Whereas the ulama didn't feel this was necessary. They felt like to write, to, to publish was to only speak of Islam in that context. Um, but they also get involved in this journalistic activity. And that's the change, I think. This imposition of the 19th century is the, what, what print technology does in the 19th century in particular, it creates the emergence of a new intelligentsia, an intelligentsia that, that can get access to information, intelligentsia that can get access to information fast, and intelligentsia that can write um, newspapers and speak in a different way. And the ulama had to then become privy to this and make adjustments. And so then the emergence of the new intelligentsia interacting with the ulama created a new alim. It created an alim that was aware of this language that was taking place, and at the same time attached to their own language. And there was some, some tensions here because before the ulama would hold each other to account. Now in the printed press, the new intelligentsia is holding them to account. What's going on here, right? So in that sense, um, the printed press is fascinating for me. It needs real investment by Muslims, apart from the just, you know, tragic narratives continuously of the Muslims failed because they weren't printing. Actually, a lot of, there was a lot of like um, good things that came with printing, but all negatives that came with printing. And Twitter probably is an example of that. Well, of course, yes, and and this new intelligentsia of, uh, is uh, is is somewhat independent from uh, the the ulama class and and the ilmiya system, um, and and uh, I suppose this creates um, new currents within the the Muslim uh, Muslim government within the Muslim polity within the Islamic uh, Caliphate, uh, and you have the emergence of the Young Turk movement. Uh, now, uh, can I ask about uh, the interactions between this movement and Sultan Abdul Hamid II and what ultimately led to his, uh, his, uh, 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 his uh, demise and, and his um, uh, removal from office by the Sheikh al-Islam? Um, you know, what, what was going on there? Why was um, uh, the, uh, a very popular caliph, a very, you know, as you said, that, you know, Muslims today even, they, they see... Sultan Abdul Hamid II to be a someone who reinvigorated uh, the Ottoman Caliphate. Um, what happened there in, in that period to lead to the removal of Abdul Hamid? You know, the popular narrative is is that uh, okay. So the Muslim narrative is the belief in some form of conspiracy, some sort of like collusion that's taken place either with free, free Masonic activity or Zionism, and as a result, that's why Abdul Hamid is removed from power. Um, but that's not what the general historiography in Ottoman study shows. The general historiography of Ottoman study shows is that um, there was a sense of frustration of the, uh, of the Sultan being in power for 30 years um, and a young, newer generation of, regarding 
uh, and the military junta in particular were frustrated with this style of governance. And so, in, what was the problem with his style of governance? There was it was a patronage system. One, mm. so um, in, in that sense, if you were not um, Abdul Hamid was very um, good to people who were loyal to him and and served them and served him well. Loyalty was important for Abdul Hamid, but then what it did is it diminished the possibilities of meritocracy. In that sense, that created Abdul Hamid had constructed a spy network as one of the ways of gathering intelligence around the Ottoman domains as a way of knowing what was happening in the Ottoman domains. But as a result, the spy network created a sense of a paranoia amongst society of masses. Um, and the spy network had to be funded in a particular way. So it became a job. So people wanted to be spies as a way of making money. So yeah. what I'm saying is everything has a positive and a negative. I mean, Abdul Hamid may have had good intentions with this, but you can see the, uh, the ramifications of these sort of things. Abdul Hamid um, balancing act of trying to balance the colonial powers in terms of the aggression to the Ottoman domains um, was seen near the end as, as, as a problem for, by some of the young Turks because they wanted the Ottomans to be far more offensive. They felt that the Balkans were being lost and this sort of pragmatic policy in the Balkans was problematic. And so they wanted to be more front foot. Hence World War I, they went front foot. We saw what happened there. So it, it's, you can see these are regular complaints that anyone makes in any given state when a person's in power for 30 years, right? In the case of the Olava, it's even more interesting because when you start to see their works, there is a distinction that I saw between uh, the authority of the caliph in the person and the authority in the institution of the caliphate. They wanted to make a distinction. So I'll, I'll break it down. So some people felt that the caliph, um, people should adhere to a good charismatic caliph who's religious. And that each caliph should be religious, should be pious, and he should have a particular... Uh, Abdul Hamid wasn't charismatic, but he was enigmatic to a certain degree. And so there was an attachment to Abdul Hamid the person. And so a lot of the Sufi tariqats created a particular culture of, of, of venerating Abdul Hamid because he was the caliph. And so authority should be given to him because he, because he of him as the particular type of caliph he is. What other members of the ulama were making the case is it doesn't matter who the individual is. The, authority, um, the allegiance should be given to the institution of the caliphate. So even if the caliph is good, bad, weak, whatever, it's irrelevant. The seat of the caliphate is where the authority should be given to. And so people should, it's very legalistic in that sense, you can see. So for them, um, because we have Mehmed Rashad who comes after Abdul Hamid, who's not charismatic. And, and people accuse him of being a weak caliph. And the ulama say, it doesn't matter if he's a weak caliph. He's still the caliph. The seat is important. Support the seat of the caliphate. And I guess what they were trying to do is they wanted to create a allegiance to the institution of the khilafah itself. Whereas the people who were supporters of Abdul Hamid wanted to put the um, uh, emphasis on the institution of the Khalifa. And so now we're seeing these two contestations. And so this was why I guess this blurring takes place where the need for written documentation becomes important. There is your allegiance to the Khalifa or is your allegiance to the Khilafa? And people might think that's the same, but it's not the same in that sense, right? So it's the same in America. Is your allegiance to Trump the president or is your allegiance to the presidency? Um, and so here um, you can start to see the ulama trying to develop a discourse. And Abdul Hamid, unfortunately for him, became a victim of that. He became a victim of an intellectual current, which was taking place of trying to, um, trying to fashion a, a sort of structure of what the caliphate ought to be. Constitution, parliament, holding the caliph to account and so forth. And even this becomes problematic because people said, how are you gonna, how can you hold Abdul Hamid to account? Are you kidding me? Like he's the, he's the caliph. So I give you another example. When Abdul Hamid was near the end of his reign and the parliament had reopened, the parliament had called the, Sheikh, the new Sheikh al-Islam in to answer questions on the, the way that the institution of the Ilmiya was using the waqf money. So they said, hey, you know, you're making such and such money. Where's it going? And Abdul Hamid found that abhorrent. He goes, how dare they, they, they bring the Sheikh al-Islam into parliament in front of non-Muslims in this way and drill him? So you can see that there is a shift taking place in culture, whereas the parliamentarians are saying, we need to know where this money is going. Like, what are you doing with it? And everybody can be held to account. And you also can be held to account. And Abdul Hamid is aware that if the Sheikh al-Islam is being held to account, I'm also going to be held to account. 
And there's another culture that says culture, respect, ihtiram, and so forth. You don't speak to people. Like these are, this is a Sheikh al-Islam. This is the caliph. What are you doing? So you can see even within the ulama corpse, there is a contestation, an intellectual contestation, a generational contestation in regards to this. And that for me is really fascinating, to be honest with you. I, I, I loved reading that, about that and seeing that. Um, when the, the fatwa was written about to remove Abdul Hamid from power, the younger generation of uh, ulama had no fear. They didn't venerate him in the same way. They, they, they didn't, you know, it wasn't concerned for, but the older ulama, uh, when in parliament they were asked to stand up, they wouldn't stand up, they were nervous because of that. So you've seen there's a changing of culture as well. And I think throughout Ottoman history, um, you see this continual changing of, of what it means in regards to authority. And I think one of the things I've learned here regarding the ulama and authority is how do we understand authority? How do we understand obedience? How do we understand disobedience? How do you understand um, what is it that we give our allegiance to? And for me, that's what I saw continuously in that period. Uh, in that answer, you talk about the rise of Wahhabism and Salafism in the Arabian Peninsula. How did the Ottoman ulama react to, respond to these new trends, uh, especially since these trends were deeply undermining of the coherency of the Ottoman state? Um, I I'm sure in Istanbul there's an agitation. Uh, there's an agitation simply because of the fact that there's an attempt to delegitimize the caliphate of the Ottomans. But on the same degree, um, there is a tolerance towards it as well. Um, because as I mentioned before, the plurality of ideas, it's not just that we see the rise of Wahhabism and then in, 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 in the Najd area or the wide rise of Salafism in Bilad Sham. We also see, we saw the rise of Mahdism um, in uh, in Sudan. We see the rise of Nachabandism in 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 the Ottoman domain. So various um, um, ideas and peoples were able to uh, to fashion their voice. And the Ottomans, from what I understand, had always maintained a policy of uh, management. It's it's an idea of management. You just they had to stay to some degree. How do you remove that? I mean, there are attempts of certain individuals being arrested and so forth. And okay, in the earlier period of Mahmoud II, since Mehmed Ali Pasha to, to crush the Wahhabi revolt in that sense, that there is a particular form of aggression that takes place, but the Wahhabis come back um, in, in intellectually and, and start to, um, and so what we see is a intellectual contestation between various ulama, you know, publishing the works, refuting one another. Um, th there is a emergence or because of the British to delegitimize the Ottomans as a proper caliphate. But this coincides at the same time with certain Wahhabi Salafist ideas of delegitimization. The Ottoman ulama then write tracks, you know, countering those forms of delegitimization and so forth. And so it's just a continued intellectual, um, you know, hot pot in that sense that just doesn't stop. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, actually, um, we, when we talk about uh, Islamic classical fiqh and, and uh, scholarship. We we tend to uh, talk about Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah and and those who who came before them of the Salaf, and we we talk about even the Muslim scholars and even philosophers that come from Spain. And and you know often uh, when especially in in today's era when uh, Islam is taught, you know it it will be commonly taught from classical books, and these classical books usually come from the Abbasid and Umayyad era or or, or from, um, you know, in, in the case of India, from the, you know, the, the Mughal uh, area. But we don't see very much, um, uh, at least in, in the general Muslim world, maybe not so in Turkey, but we don't see a reference and a, a veneration of, of uh, Islamic scholarship that comes out of this Ottoman domain or this Ilmiya system. Um, why is that? I'm not sure that's the case. I think amongst ulama, if you speak to ulama, so I remember when I was in Damascus, um, I had friends who were ulama, I speak to them, and they were reading works produced by ulama of the Ottoman period, especially late on. So Ibn Abidin in Damascus was very popular in terms of Hanafi faith. Mustafa Sabri Effendi, a lot of people read Mustafa, and now Sabri Effendi's works are being translated. It's not like he, it wasn't, you know, it's been translated in, Mokof al was recently translated into Turkish. Um, it's not that. What it indicates, I think, is our imagination of how we perceive the ulama. Um, many of us who have a perception of the ulama are not students of ulama din, by the way. So um, <laughs> what works are actually being read or not read 
um, you know, is we are regular students are not privy to that. But if you speak to people who are doing ulum al din, they they are reading works. They read the majalla, by the way. And I remember in Syria, the Hanafi scholars were reading the majalla. It was the Syrian scholars who initially told me before my coming to Istanbul that the majalla was within the the remit of the Hanafi law school, right? So, um, so it is being read in that sense. Something. This is just my own personal opinion. I could be wrong, and I'm sure people will, will counter me on this. There is something going on in our current predicament where we need to see our ulama as certain celebrities or superstars, whether it's in the ones that exist right now or the ones that we, we draw from it when we go into the past. And so, you know, we look at Taymiyyah, Ghazali. We, 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 speak, we pick out specific individuals, but there's large gaps in history amongst them, by the way. And we, we popularize their works and we seem to assume that those are the only works that exist. But in reality, the ulama across the board have been continuously publishing um, and, um, and refashioning. So what I find like, why is it that we go to the medieval period um, to try to draw our answers from? Well, it's an interesting point. Why is it that we go to Ghazali? Why is it we go to Mawardi? Why is it we go to Bakilani, um, to Taymiyyah, in regards to looking at the formation of uh, political structures or educational learning? Um, what can Taymiyyah tell us about creating institutions such as the Ottoman uh, Madrasa system? What can Taymiyyah tell us about in the modern period in regards to um, the use of print technology? What can Taymiyyah tell us about the possibility of... So, you know, the, the question was um, initially asked, like, you know, the Sahaba would, would, would pick, um, would make judgment. It, it's unheard of today, you know, someone coming to tape Erdogan and saying, uh, you know, my son has, has, has been killed by the guy next door. The world has changed in that sense. And so you can see that in the late Ottoman period, the new um, structures that exist are very, very close to what we can comprehend today, at least, um, in terms of that governmental structure. So... Um, it's not just their books, and this is the other thing that people are only interested in the works the ulama write. Well, what did the ulama do? Um, um, and this is why I'm saying that Mustafa Sabri was a journalist, he's a parla parliamentarian. And I think that the other thing is, is we keep looking at the ulama as these pockets and these individuals. But we don't look at them, as I say, as a meta institution, as a block, and the necessity of having ulama just by and large, and their visibility is necessary within Muslim society and the absence of the ulama within Muslim societies, within Muslim civilization is to the detriment of Muslims, to the detriment of our civilization in that sense. And so um, I'm not sure what's going on here because when I look at the ulama, I'm looking at the ulama as a whole. I'm saying the ulama, the word is in the plural, need to exist. Whereas people keep picking out individual alims and in their works. And that's fine if that's what they want to study. Um, but um, they're studying the works of the ulama. They're not studying the ulama. Um, and th that goes back to my question of history. The absence of history in, 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 in the learning of, of, of Muslims. It's not there. And that needs to change a little bit. Let's turn to contemporary times. I mean, uh, the ulama, of course, in, in the, the, the era now of, of secular republics and secular states, it has... A very diminished role in in Muslim society, and um, uh, here in Turkey, you know, we see that there is uh, still a very a thriving uh, madrasa or a thriving uh, ulama system, but it doesn't have the same level of impact for all the reasons that you mentioned earlier on and that we've detailed today. Um, you, you've called for the revitalization of of the ulama class, um, to, you know, to the uh, you know, I, I don't know if your if your if your argument is to, you know, to to the same level as how the Ottomans uh, uh, visualize the ulama class. But can you expand on that? What why why should we have an ulama body like the Ottoman body today? You know, when people talk about the uh, Turkish Republic and the creation of the Turkish Republic, Muslims, uh, shall I say, they, they 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 talk about the trauma of the uh, abolishment of the caliphate, the khilaf. What they don't look at in particular is the Turkish Republic actually went after the ulama as a meta institution. Because um, to remove an institution like the caliphate, um, I'm not saying it's easy to do this, but it's easier to um, bring back 
an idea of the return of an institution in the minds of Muslims than it is to bring back a meta institution such as the ulama. And what I mean by that is, okay, look, they changed the language from Ottoman Turkish to Turkish. That affected the ulama. They removed Arabic. That affected the ulama. They closed the madrasas. That affected the ulama. They closed the Nizamiya courts. That affected the ulama. They banned them from wearing headdress. That affected the ulama. They, closed, they took them out of parliament. That Every single place where Islam's gaze was upon, they gutted it out. Literally, it was an extreme form of gutting that's taking place. That didn't happen to the institution caliphate. All they did is they just closed that institution down. But they knew that that institution was dependent on the institution of the, the meta institution of the ulama. That the ulama could revive the mindset, the mentality, the authority. How can you administer Sharia when there's nobody to administer Sharia? So, you, okay, you, let's just say, Turkey tomorrow says it's a caliphate. How do you administer the Sharia? You need, you need practitioners of the Sharia. You need judges of the Sharia. You need educators of the Sharia. You need all of these things. This only comes from the ulama class in that sense. So the Turkish Republic was well aware what it was doing when it was gutting this out. It totally ripped it out in, in terms of Turkish society because it knew that the only way that it could fashion a new identity regarding the Turkish Republic was to do that. In the Arab provinces, they did something else. They used different forms of violence to manipulate, cajole, and, and, and control the ulama. Some will say not so successfully. Some will say they were successful. Um, this is why you could then see ulama throughout modern history in the Arab provinces trying to find um, pragmatic ways of surviving because they, they are well aware of what happens. In the Balkans, once again, the ulama were removed because of forms of communism in the way that happened in the Turkish Republic. So the absence of this meta institution, it really impacts the manner in which the average person interacts with Islam. Their interaction of Islam is left to their own agency. Their vi the visibility of Islam is absent. So they are dependent on, on what they do themselves in that sense. Last week in Turkey, Syrian, some Syrian members of the ulama came to Fatimos. The place was packed to the rafters, absolutely packed, because people in Syria, as critical as they are of their ulama, still recognize that the agency of Islam still comes from them. That if people want to know of Islam, who can they turn to? And it's very hard in that sense. So not only do ulama write books, they're judges, they're scholars, they're imams, they do weddings, they do funerals. It, it's what I'm saying, that's how deeply entrenched they are. And the question is, is people will ask, can they come back? Why not? Why can they not come back? The Islam as a tradition is still very vibrant. Um, we as Muslims are still here. The ulama around the world are still here. Many Muslims are coming backwards and forwards. And in Turkey, people do study ulum ad -din. It just needs a, a particular... Um, if, if people are telling me that they can imagine the return of a caliphate, then why is it unimaginable, the return of the ulama? Why is it unimaginable? Actually, that should be more imaginable in my eyes. And I think that any institution um, such as um, a, a Khilafah system is dependent on the existence of the ulama. What comes first, the ulama system or the caliphate? I, to be honest, I haven't even thought about that question. So mm. I, I, I'll be reluctant to answer that right now because I don't know. I, I can go away and, and you know have cups of coffee and, and think <laughs> about that isn't banned anymore and think about it. But the point <laughs> is, is that, I, you know, okay, let's look at the Sahaba. Yes, the Khulafa Rashidun, but the Sahaba were actually mushtahids. Okay, so what you're saying is, what we're saying is this culture of ulum ad and the maintenance of, of Islam is necessary, not only from a political perspective or an intellectual perspective, but also on a spiritual perspective. The perspective of adab, of piety, of, you know, I, I was in Fatih and I saw one of the Syrian ulama and it's just intriguing to see the visibility. One of the things the Turkish Republic did, it's very fascinating. Uniforms matter, by the way, we forget this. Okay, you, what you wear matters. When you see a police officer, when you see a nurse, you see a uniform, you have a particular um, relationship with that form of identification. The ulama have a uniform. They wear it when they walk down the street and it's a visibility of Islam, just the way the mosque is a visibility. It's a form of soft power. It matters because it maintains a particular um, 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 sort of like, um, adherence that Islam is, is, is around us, just like how I have calligraphy in my house, is to remind me of Allah's existence in my house, right? And so 
that was taken away from them. So you can't see them. The minute they became invisible in this country, it's not that the ulama had disappeared in this country, they become invisible. Mm -hmm. And when they become invisible, it became harder for the masses to identify with Islam's presence on the day to day. It had to be sought. Um, in Syria, I still remember when I was in Syria and in Egypt, when you see an alim walking down, it was intriguing people's behavior in that sense. There, it, 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 there was something there. Um, the issue of ibadat. And so, oh, sorry, the point I'm making is men, men were attacked before women. We talk about hijabs being attacked in, in the modern period, but actually it was the men who were attacked first. It was the ulama who were attacked first. They were not just in Turkey, but across the board, they were forced to take off their fezes, forced to take off their turbans as a way of removing that visibility. And that was exceptionally violent. And they've gone through a lot in that sense. And so I'm a little bit sympathetic now as a historian. I can take a step back in terms of, we, I guess we're asking so much from the ulama class, but we haven't come to terms with what is the ulama class as a younger, newer generation? And, and what does that mean to us? And for me, as an older Muslim, I'm showing my age a little bit. I recognize that um, the existence of this institution is necessary because it seeps into every aspect of Muslim life. Um, it regulates our governance. It regulates our society. It creates a relationship between society and governance in adherence to, the, to Islam. It regulates law. It, re it regulates um, piety and it regulates forms of worship. That is very comprehensive. Um, and that I think um, I would say that's necessary for every Muslim society. That's the case I make for Turkey, which is it's not that Turkey is a special case, but I believe that that's necessary in every society, and that it should permit the plurality of of thought, the plurality of ideas, and the pr plurality of legal tradition. And that's the Islamic tradition. And when we see that more and more, I think we're going to have a healthier Muslim world. Um, so that's why I, I, I make that case. Um, but it's just a personal. Um, Dr. Yaqub Ahmed, Jazakallah Khair for your time today. It's been uh, it's been great. And uh, uh, what's next for you? Are you um uh, you, you we, the last time we spoke, you were you were thinking about producing uh, a, a, a book in in written form. You were thinking to uh, to write about your experience of the ulama in in the latter part of the Ottoman state. Are you are you planning to uh, to produce anything sometime soon? Um. I, I'm working on, on, on certain things at the moment. I'm working on one article on the impact of the Ottoman constitution on Asiatic societies, um, because a lot of the narratives is Eurocentric. And uh, I, I want to show that actually the Ottomans were Asiatic and African at the same time. And the Asiatic world was looking at the Ottomans. And obviously the book, but I'm a very slow writer. One of the things I've learned now is I just want to write in my own time. Um, and as a result, because I don't produce much, um, you know, um, there is an assumption that um, maybe I'm not a real historian. Um, I admit this to anyone listening out there. I say this hand on heart. There are better Ottoman historians than me in Istanbul. I do not dispute that. And they are doing fantastic works. And many have written like Ismail Kara, for example, some wonderful works on the Ottoman ulema. Abdul Rahman Achil is another one. Mehmet Ifshirli is another one. These are fantastic um, academics and the Mehmet Ifshirli, for example, and Ismail Khara are giants in the field of um, um, ulama studies regarding the Ottomans in that sense. Salim Argun is another one who works for the Diyanet, and they've done wonderful work. I am just very slow, um, and um, I, I don't know. that I, I, I've become one of those slow writers. But inshallah, I, I, I've become uh, more, um, what can I say, motivated to write now. So hopefully within the next year or so, I will start publishing more. That can be of benefit to the Ummah. I want to write, if there is support for this, I want to write a comprehensive primer on Ottoman history for Muslim. Um, what I've noticed is that the majority of the primers that are written are not written by taking the Muslim audience into account, which is the type of questions they ask and what they ought to know. So this is something that's now in the pipeline because a lot of Muslims have been asking me. Because as I said to you before, um, Ottoman studies is a Western enterprise. It's, we don't see this in the Muslim madrasa systems around the world. And yet there is an increase in um, interest now of 600 years of history. And um, so that's the plan, um, but um, it's an ambitious one, but um, it, it, I think it can be done. Just a little bit of push and a little bit of help. Inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you and uh... Uh, keep you strong and 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 you know i think in as you said that 
um, you, you have these Ottoman historians, but in English language, uh, we, we certainly don't have um, Ottoman history from a Muslim perspective. And I think it will be really important to have that. And I think Western Ottoman academics, who we do have Muslims who are Ottoman historians, by the way, very good ones. Um, and so Western academics have often made the argument to me, who are colleagues of mine, why do you want to write one from a Muslim perspective? Like, what, what are you trying to Islamize the history? Which is not the intention here. What I'm saying is that their requirements, their needs are different from yours. This is even we see in the case of Marshall Hodgson, who makes this case in his Venture for Islam, recognizing that, you know, there is a need. Um, there are two different languages taking place here. And the Muslims also need to be able to um, relate to Ottoman studies from their perspective. So this is not an attempt of Islamization, if that's what people are accusing me of. This is an attempt to try to um, make it relevant and relatable for Muslims because um, they read history differently. And I think that they should, they ought to have that. Have you read, uh, you, you, you must have come across Tamim Ansari's book, Is Destiny Disrupted? Yeah. Uh, which looks at Islamic history in general. And the Ottoman you know, a bit of it is, is probably quite brief. And, and I, I suspect taken from uh, lots, largely Western sources. Uh, but I think that style of book is, it's very engaging. It, it reads like a story. Um, so it's, it's easy for the ordinary reader like myself to, to engage with the subject. Um, and, but it, it's a good style of writing, I think. I think this is where Bernard Lewis was successful. Actually. Yeah, he was. Bernard yeah. Lewis was a good um, historian, no doubt. Yeah, but yeah. where he was able to push his Orientalism was that he wrote well and people enjoyed what he was writing. Yes. He, he created stories, he created narratives. Yes. And they stuck. Uh, Barakal, I think we should get together sometime. I, I would really like to come and see you. Yeah, if you, if you come in all the way from where you're at, <laughs> <laughs> into the centre, then, then so whenever you come into the centre, give me a shout. Jazakallah khair, inshallah. I'll speak to you soon. Okay. Yeah? Just a final word. I have some great guests to announce over the coming weeks. To find out more, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at thinking underscore Muslim. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Jalalain. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my thanks to my team, without whom I could not have made this project work. Riaz Hassan, Musab Muhammad, Reem Walid, Adil Alam, Yusra Zainuddin, Ahmed Sirag and Ahaz Atif. These brothers and sisters are very busy with their studies and work, but give up valuable time to help this project. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them sincerely and please keep them in your du'as.